This afternoon, we have a very distinguished speaker, Professor P. Balram. Professor Balram is a professor of molecular biophysics and is currently the director of the Indian Institute of Science, right here on our campus, of course. Prior to this, he was lecturer, assistant professor and associate professor, uh, all at this center here. He's also been a chairman of Division of Biological Sciences at the Institute. His main research interests are in bioorganic chem chemistry and molecular biophysics. He's the author of over 370 research papers. He has received his MSc from IIT Kanpur and PhD in chemistry from Carnegie Mellon, Pittsburgh. He's a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy, and the Third World Academy of Sciences. Uh, he has received many awards and honors in recognition of his work, um, some of which are the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize and the Alumni Award for Excellence in Research from IASC, TWAS Award in Chemistry, GD Birla Award for Scientific Research, and Distinguished Alumnus Award of IIT Kanpur, and also the Padma Shri by the Government of India. Professor Balram has delivered a number of lectures and has served on the editorial boards of journals, both national and international. He's also, he also serves on many committees of the Government of India and is currently a member of the Science Advisory Committee in, to the Union Cabinet. He's on the board of uh, research in the Nuclear Science of DAE and on the advisory board of CSIR and Scientific Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. He's also been the editor of Current Science for over 10 years. I invite uh, Professor Balram to speak on ethics of science. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, when Dr. Uh, Sangeeta Menon wrote a letter to me asking me to speak in this course, she uh, suggested that I talk on uh, ethics in life sciences. I am a biologist by uh, training and practice. And when I saw her title, uh, I suggested immediately that maybe I could change it and talk a little bit more generally about science. And I was going to give the topic as ethics in science. Uh, then I decided that it would be more appropriate if I changed it to ethics of science because I think this would be the more generally uh, interesting talk. As we go along, you will see that it makes a great deal of difference whether it's ethics in science or the ethics of science. Now, grammar and uh, punctuation were highlighted some time ago in this book and this was a rather interesting book which suggested that punctuation actually changes the meaning of uh, entire sentences. And this book was a bestseller for quite some time. Uh, you will see this difference as I go along as to what I really mean by this. Uh, if you take a dictionary definition of ethics, ethics will be defined in this manner a system of moral principles. And if an ordinary person looks at a definition like this, uh, you really need another definition to tell you what a system of moral principles really is. It's also defined as the branch of philosophy dealing with the right and wrong of certain actions and the good and bad of such actions. So one has somewhat general and sometimes difficult to understand definitions of ethics uh, in dictionaries. But I thought I would begin with a statement which I have borrowed from Einstein. We've just recently completed the year of physics and therefore Einstein is an appropriate source to look for discussions of ethics. What Einstein said was that it is the privilege of man's genius impersonated by inspired individuals to advance ethical axioms which are so comprehensive and well-founded that men will accept them as grounded in the vast mass of their individual emotional experiences. But he went on to add something rather interesting. He said ethical axioms are found and tested not very differently from the axioms of science. And then he concluded by saying truth is what stands the test of experience. And you will see what a discussion of ethics in science will really involve as I go along. But since many of you are not in science, I thought I would begin by providing a rather old description of science. It's over half a century old. 
but it is this description which really drove the advance of modern science, particularly in the United States. And what was written here by Vannevar Bush was, science by itself provides no panacea for individual social and economic ills. It can be effective in na national welfare only as a member of a team. But without scientific progress, no amount of achievement in other directions can ensure our health, prosperity, and security. It is this statement which has driven much of modern science. It has driven the investment in science. It has driven the investment in science by governments, by industries. And uh, it's provided the rationale for the public support of science over the last 50 to 60 years. Science itself is a way of understanding the world. And technology which will accompany science is a way of controlling the world. Now, most people's perceptions of the relationships between science and technology is really in this linear fashion, where you go from science to an applied science to engineering and to technology. I would like to suggest that this sequence of events is unrealistic. And very many times, the course of science does not really follow this linear sequence. But we wouldn't worry too much about science if it were not for the fact that science today has become a major national activity. It's an activity which dominates thinking in government. Till the Second World War, most of the science that was practiced was low budget science. So one did not have to worry too much about science and its consequences. Today, when I touch upon the ethics of science, really we are going to worry about science, the consequences of practicing science, and is there any kind of ethical framework in which science needs to be practiced. I actually picked this cartoon out some years ago to give a lecture in this very institution. But I thought I would show this to you again. This is an old cartoon which appeared almost 10 years ago in the Hindu. But at that time, there was a problem. There was this problem of Ramar Pillai who, had, who claimed that he had invented a new form of petrol called herbal petrol. And of course, there was this feeling that here was this gentleman who had come out from nowhere and who had now made a discovery which all the national laboratories in India had failed to make. And so it was a claim which captured the public imagination. Because here was someone who had not been funded by the vast apparatus of government, who was in fact solving a problem with which we are still confronted, unfortunately. And he made this claim. But after some time, it turned out that the claims were found to be incorrect. And then, of course, we ended up in this situation. There is a problem with the practice of science. Science needs to be validated. Science needs to be tested. Scientific advance is need to be well grounded. On the other hand, if you look at the arts, artistic freedom is almost completely of, it's almost total freedom. There is a license to do just about anything. Of course, even here, sometimes you will find we have ma many moral policemen who tell you what should be done and what should not be done. But then, of course, this is a picture of M.F. Hussein, then running wild. I think he was not allowed into the Bombay, into the Cricket Club of India, because he went barefoot uh, to the club premises. But they felt that this should not be allowed. But that's artistic freedom. But pure science, one might ask, why should one practice pure science? But Peter Medeva said this years ago that pure, pure science requires no justification outside itself, and its usefulness has no bearing on its validation. So pure science is simply practiced because one likes to practice it, and one would like to understand the natural world by studying science. From this point onwards, I'm going to turn to what different thinkers have really worried about when thinking about science and the problem of ethics. And I will turn to a scientist, the crystallographer Max Perutz, who won a Nobel Prize many years ago for determining the structure of the protein hemoglobin. But Perutz, throughout his career, was a thinker and a writer. He probably wrote as many book reviews in the New York Review of Books as he did scientific papers.
And each one of his book reviews is an essay which is well worth reading. Now, Perutz worried about this distinction between the sciences and the humanities. And many years ago, in 1959, in delivering the Reed Lectures at Cambridge, the British novelist and politician, bureaucrat, whatever have you, C.P. Snow, had also worried about this. And Snow's lectures came out in the form of a book which was entitled The Two Cultures. In fact, Snow, in his lectures, immortalized a phrase, The Two Cultures, which people have used repeatedly over the last half a century or so. But here is Pirouz. What he says is that imagination comes first in both artistic and scientific creation, which makes for one culture rather than two. But while the artist is confined only by the prescriptions imposed by himself and the culture surrounding him, the scientist has nature and his critical colleagues always looking over his shoulder. So there is a difference between the practice of science and the arts. There is a system of checks, balances in science, and one always has people looking over you. For the ordinary scientist, of course, it's the peer reviewer. When you submit a paper to a journal, it is immediately refereed by individuals who very often tell you that what you have written doesn't deserve to be published or is all wrong, and then you go back and try to correct yourself. But there have been somewhat different views of science and I thought I would show you two. The first one is due to Max Planck. And Planck said there is a real world independent of our senses. The laws of nature were not invented by man, but forced upon him by that natural world. They are the expression of a rational order. This is a view which is held by physicists. They search for a rational order in everything that they see around them. And they believe that there are natural laws which govern everything that you see around you. Sometimes one even tries to see whether there are natural laws governing such apparently uh, uh, ununderstandable things like behavior. But of course, this branch of science is not one which is really the province of ethicists. It's more the province of philosophers. And Richard Feynman, in his uh, characteristically dismissive fashion, said that philosophers of science are about as you helpful to scientists as ornithologists are to birds. So many times, I think, even in NIAS, you have philosophers of science. They look at science from a distance. They worry about the philosophy of science. And sometimes uh, Feynman's somewhat magisterial dismissal of the philosophy of science is useful to bear in mind. But it's really in the mid-20th century that this question about ethics and science really began to acquire some importance. And I want to show you some mid-20th century appraisals of science. This was around 1957. What it says is this, the mighty edifice of government science dominated the scene in the middle of the 20th century as a Gothic cathedral dominated a 13th century landscape. The work of many hands over many years, it universally inspired admiration wonder and fear. Now you must now at this point ask yourself the question that in the middle of the 20th century science is, modern science is already about 150 years old. And at this point science universally inspires admiration, it inspires wonder, but it also inspires fear. And you might ask why does science inspire fear? Because by this time both Hiroshima and Nagasaki had already happened. And we can see Oppenheimer's view a little bit after these events in 1956, the time when Oppenheimer was probably in the most difficult period of his career after the McCarthy hearings had taken place in the United States. But what Oppenheimer said when he had retired by this time to the Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, he said, we've done the devil's work. Now we have come back to our real job, which is to devote ourselves exclusively to research. Now it is really the statement of Oppenheimer's which sets the ethicists thinking. Should scientists now carry out work without worrying about what the consequences of that work might really be? And if 
something unfortunate like the development of atomic weapons takes place, then can they just simply go back and devote themselves to research without giving it a second thought as a matter which is now behind them. In thinking about this, I want to read you another statement. What must properly be called the ideology of science forbids thinking of it in the equivocal terms of politics. The discourse of science is neutral, a neutrality guaranteed by the objectivity of the method, which presupposes rigor, attention to facts, and respect for proof. It is really this view of science, which sometimes is the most disturbing view of science, a completely neutral view of science in which you do not worry what would be the consequence of a scientific advance, whether a particular line of research should be pursued or should not be pursued. Is there some kind of barrier which must be placed in some fields of science to prevent advance along the wrong directions? It is this that many people worry about. This objective neutrality of science is something that is very disturbing to the non-scientist at times. There have been many ethical dilemmas in science, and I want to show you the most famous of the ethical dilemmas, but we will come to others. The most famous ethical dilemma was the problem of nuclear weapons. And uh, after Hiroshima, Leo Szilard, who was one of the people who tried to prevent the development of the atomic bomb, was in fact told that the atomic bomb was a tragedy of scientists. And what Szilard replied was, it is not the tragedy of scientists, it is the tragedy of mankind. Zillard himself was a very interesting figure. Uh, there is one story about Zillard which I found, which was rather interesting, that Zillard apparently attended a seminar in which Ernest Rutherford, at that time the reigning Pope of Physics, declared rather emphatically that atomic energy would never be a reality. And on the way back, Zillard, who never believed in authority, thought about this, and it was then that he really thought of the concept of the chain reaction. And there is a patent, in fact, which he filed on the concept of the chain reaction. But ironically, Zillard, in later years, was the man who really worked very hard to try to see that this chain reaction never really reached uh, reality. There is a second famous problem. And that problem also is a problem which arose during the Second World War, and those are the gas chambers of Auschwitz. Now, I was reminded of these two ethical problems some years ago, and I will tell you when. I became the editor of Current Science in 1995, when I joined my senior colleague, Professor Ramaseshan, in editing the journal. Now, Professor Ramaseshan was a man, a physicist, who had read very widely, and he was extraordinarily knowledgeable about many things. And he used to tell me about many subjects of which I knew nothing. And I used to just listen to him somewhat quietly. In 1998, in May of 1998, the atomic explosions which were set off in Pokhran, Pokhran II, happened. We were then the editors of Current Science. And of course, when this happened, we were as surprised as anybody else when we opened the newspaper one morning in May and found that these atomic explosions had taken place. Now, of course, by that time, I had started writing in Current Science. I had begun to write a fortnightly editorial. And I had begun to write this fortnightly editorial on which I was commenting on many, many topics. And the atomic explosions caught me completely by surprise. At this point, if I had followed my instincts, I would have written against the atomic explosions. But I did not follow my instincts. I, in fact, followed, I think, what was the path of common sense. And the path of common sense at that time was just to keep quiet. And that's what I did. And. Uh, Sometime later, in an article which was submitted to Current Science, one of my former colleagues at the Indian Institute of Science, Professor Amulya Reddy, wrote a commentary arguing against the rationale for setting off nuclear explosives.
he also had come back from a visit to Germany where he had gone to see Auschwitz. And when he submitted this article, he said, since your journal has been so silent about these issues, I thought I would raise them. And I had to publish this, admitting that I had at that time been a little bit uh, too timid in not actually expressing what my views were openly. But I went back and then read what Professor Reddy was arguing. And I found that Professor Reddy's criticism, where he had called me both, uh, he had said that uh, we were in fact being unethical in not discussing these matters in current science. This is true. We had not discussed it at that point. I went back and looked at this, and I also showed this to Professor Ramseshan, who was by that time already somewhat unwell. And Professor Ramseshan then pro pointed out to me that the gas chambers of Auschwitz were in fact linked to what we might call the tragedy of Fritz Haber. Fritz Haber was a German physical chemist, and Haber is the man who did this fundamental work on the synthesis of ammonia, which is today called the Haber process for the synthesis of ammonia. The Haber-Bosch process is what produces ammonia. And in the year 2000, when we were all celebrating the turn of the new century, the dawn of the new millennium, whatever have you, the American, uh, the British journal Nature had a set of essays. Every week there would be an essay throughout that year. And these essays were marvelous. Each one was wonderfully readable. And there was this one essay written by Václav Schmil, who said, he asked the question, what is the most outstanding discovery or the most advanced, outstanding advance of 20th century science? After all, 20, the 20th century is past now. Can we look back at the 20th century and label one scientific discovery as the most outstanding discovery of 20th century science? And he chose one. If I asked all of you to choose one discovery of 20th century science that you think is outstanding, you will all have different ideas. But the discovery that he chose, or, or the advance that he pointed out, was the harbor synthesis of ammonia. And the harbor synthesis of ammonia is one of those things that you read. It's a boring event when you read it in the chemistry textbook when you're in school. Every child wants to forget the harbor synthesis of ammonia with which one teaches chemical equilibria, uh, Le Chatelier's principle, catalysis, and so forth. But why is the harbor synthesis of ammonia so important? It's so important because without ammonia, there would have been no urea. And without urea, the advances of agriculture over the 20th century would never have been fueled. If the, popu the world's population in the 20th century has been fed, it is largely because of the development of fertilizer. And it is the development of fertilizer which has saved more lives than any other. And what Vaxlaf Smil pointed out in this article was the harbor discovery was probably the most useful discovery to humanity of the 20th century. But Harbour was also the man who invented the Zyklon capsule. This was the capsule, the potassium cyanide capsule, into which if you drop hydrochloric chloric acid or sulfuric acid, you will produce hydrogen cyanide gas. And that is what you produce in the gas chambers of Auschwitz. Many years later, in the 1970s, the path of 20th century science was reviewed, not only the path of 20th century science, it is in fact the path of science since the dawn of time itself, was reviewed by Jacob Bronowski in a very famous series. It is a series which appeared uh, on BBC television, I never saw it, called The Ascent of Man. But many years later, I found a book which was, in fact, based on Bronowski's television, television series called The Ascent of Man. And it's probably one of the best books that one can read if one wants to follow the path of science almost from the dawn of time itself. But Bronowski himself is from Poland, Auschwitz is in Poland, Bronowski oh, went away in the early days of the Nazi regime to England, and he went back and looked at Auschwitz many years later when he was making 
the BBC series, and he says, this is the concentration camp and crematorium at Auschwitz. This is where people were turned into numbers. Into this pond were flushed the ashes of four million people, and that was not done by gas, it was done by arrogance. It was done by dogma, it was done by ignorance. So here Bronowski takes the view that although the Germans were technically perfect in the process of extermination, although they had brought all the tools of modern science to the process of death and in the process of dealing with death efficiently, this was not really the problem of science itself, but this was the problem of ignorance and it was the problem of dogma. But Bronowski, both scientist and philosopher, says that there are two parts to the human dilemma. One is the belief that push part in philosophy, that deliberate deafness to suffering has become the monster in the war machine. In fact, you will find that today more of modern science is driven by defense imperatives than by anything else. When, for example, we talk about grants to science, the grants that one has for science which address the problems of human suffering, they are minuscule in compared with the grants that governments give for defense. And defense is a euphemism sometimes for offense. Many of you will be senior executives, administrators, bureaucrats, what have you. And you must think about this many times. You know the defense department in the United States, for example, cannot really be a defense department because there is nobody to defend against. But it is still called a department of defense. And one must worry about this uh, sometime. But Dronowski also says a second thing, the second part of the human dilemma. He says the other is the betrayal of the human spirit, the assertion of dogma that closes the mind and turns a nation a civilization into a regiment of ghosts, obedient ghosts or tortured ghosts. It turns out that this is what happened in Germany in the Second World War and it is not that this will not happen again. This might happen again and it is already happening sometimes in countries like the United States where it is becoming increasingly difficult to have a point of view which is completely different. In fact, you will find there is a kind of national coalition which occurs, which is independent of the political spectrum to which one belongs, and that this national coalition is actually directed towards an external threat. Whenever this happens, you will find that there is a closing of the mind. But I want to turn to an Indian philosopher, our late president Radhakrishnan. And Radhakrishnan was a philosopher who had, in fact, I suspect, thought about these things. And he was, I think, at the time he was vice president and president, this was the time when uh, the Nehruvian vision had led to one laboratory after another being created in India. So I suspect the presidents and prime ministers of those times opened one new institution or the other of science and technology, and they worried about this. And I think at one of these places, he said, the purpose of scientific studies is to discover the truth about things. And the patient workers in laboratories are as much imaginative creators as poets and philosophers. So he praises science here. But he says, if science is being, being perverted from its natural purpose, if it is used not for the happiness of mankind as a whole, but for private profit and public destruction, it is not the fault of science or science. I found this sentence of Radhakrishnan's quite prophetic because you will see that there are two things here I'd like to draw your attention to. He says, but for private profit and public destruction. Public destruction we are all aware. Atomic weapons are for public destruction. The latest weapons are for public destruction. But look at something else here. But for private profit. Private profit is what drives present day globalization. Private profit is at the heart of every economic advance that the world is making today. So one must look here both at public destruction as well as private profit. Radha Krishnan also quoted Einstein. He said the present troubles of the world are due 
due to science having advanced faster than morality. When morality catches up with science, these troubles will end. But in the 50 years since Radha Krishnan said this, you will realize, of course, that science is moving even faster. I will show you areas of biology where it's moving extraordinarily fast and one has to be worried. Science is moving very fast. Morality, of course, instead of moving faster than science, is in fact probably moving even slower and has probably even been forgotten by and large. But Radha Krishnan always had a wonderful sentence for every situation. He says, our progress is not integral if moral advance does not accompany scientific achievement. The problem of our age is the reconciliation of science and wisdom in a vital harmony. It is this really which one must keep in mind when thinks, one thinks about the ethics of science. But I will turn now to a problem which is modern. If you take biology, for instance, and biology is the field of the future. If the first half of the 20th century was driven by physics, and we discussed the advances of physics and their consequences in the second half of the 20th century, you will find that the second half of the 20th century really led to biological advances. And it is the consequences of these biological advances that we are going to discuss for the next 50 years. The consequences of genetic medicine, for example, are in the areas of eugenics, where you might in fact be able to diagnose a genetic defect well in advance. Once you're able to diagnose a genetic defect, one way is of course to go back and look at something that the Nazis did look at in the middle of the 20th century. That is the science of eugenics itself. And uh, of trying to get populations which are disease free. And there are many, many ethical questions which are raised by this. The second, of course, is an ethical question which worries medical professionals very much. In the case of genetic diagnosis, you can sometimes have foreknowledge without a cure. And this raises a different kind of ethical question. Suppose, for example, a practitioner of modern medicine knows that one of his patients is going to develop a disease, say, 10 years into the future. Should he tell him now or not? Should he tell him if there is no cure available, but only the knowledge that disease will be developed is available, then of course this is a real problem. But in some cases you will find that modern medicine has advanced to the level that we can tell, for example, whether mother and father are carrying a defective gene for a particular single genetic disease. So if you take thalassemia, for example, which is a single gene disorder, if mother carries a defective gene and if father carries a defective gene, there is a one in four probability that a child will be born with the disease. Such a child, of course, will live. It will, the child will live for many years. The child will live under very difficult circumstances. Now, you are now working with statistics. You are working with the probabil with probabilities. And should one have this child or not? If you can now do fetal diagnosis, should one have an abortion or not? These are ethical questions which are not easily answered. But one can do counselling. And this thalassemia, for example, is a disease for which there is no cure at present other than transfusions. Transfusions are a major drain on public medicine. And therefore, the Mediterranean countries, for example, use marriage counselling more or less coercively in order to get rid of the defective gene in thalassemia. And over generations, they have, in fact, successfully achieved this. Then there will be the future problems of stem cells and genetic engineering. Many of you would have heard about stem cells from the paper. And I will come back to this on my next uh, slide. But in the case of stem cells, the most useful stem cells, the most useful stem cell lines will be derived from human fetuses. And the question is, at what stage does a human fetus become alive? The issue here is a scientific issue. The issue here is an ethical issue. There's a great deal of interest in stem cell therapies because stem cell therapies offer a possible therapeutic for the diseases of old age. They offer a therapeutic for many of the degenerative diseases of old age like Parkinson's disease, uh, Alzheimer's and so forth. If this research is to be done 
This research will use human stem cells and these human stem cells may be derived from human fetuses. There is of course this question, there is an ethical dilemma here, should this research go forward or should this research not be done? Of course in many places this research will be done with or without government sanction and in many countries of course government is not in a position to really take a view on these issues. Many times people will say we must have legislation but you know legislation must be informed legislation and you will find that I should not say this with uh, uh, Professor Kastari Ranga here uh, listening to me but you know it is very difficult to have informed legislation on issues which even scientists cannot really understand sometimes and they themselves have genuine doubts. So the progress of science will sometimes happen in a way in which we cannot really control and therefore I suspect this would be a course of natural evolution of uh, human beings as their knowledge advances. There are other problems of the clinical trials of new therapeutics which are being carried out in India. Here again there are many ethical questions whether populations which do not understand what they are being used for should become uh, recipients of these new therapies. I will turn now to ethics in science but I will have only one slide on this. I spoke s s thus far on what I would think are the ethics of science. We must worry about science, its consequences. But ethics in science itself is a much more mundane topic. It deals with misconduct in science, the fabrication of data, plagiarism, false claims. All of these are rampant. They are rampant but they still affect only about 1% of practiced science. Most of science is fine but it is really the misconduct which attracts the greatest public attention. And many of you would have seen recently that the Korean advances in stem cell research have all been found first there was the charge of unethical practices. The second, there was the plain and simple charge that the work had been completely fabricated. Now here there is a lesson to be learned. There is the lesson of public adulation which accompanies a scientific advance. And the poorer countries, the countries which do not have the self-confidence in themselves, which are really looking for this advance, now, for example, India is searching for Nobel Prize winners. India is searching for discoveries. India would like to be told that its scientists are doing the best research in the world. When this is so, there is an enormous pressure on scientists to perform. And when you place such pressure on human beings, there is always this problem that someone will crack. And that then leads to this. This particular Korean scientist was in fact fated on public television. He was recognized by the Korean government. He was given every national award in Korea. And after this had happened, everything had to be taken back. When the first television shows which said that his research was not true, they could not be aired because he was a public hero. And the public was ready now to attack the television station. It was only after rumors spread for months that misconduct in this particular case could in fact be uh, recognized. But there is an even more unfortunate thing here. The papers which reported this appeared in the best journals of science. This appeared in the American Journal of Science. It appeared with American co-authors from the best American universities. But what has happened is that the American co-authors have now withdrawn themselves from the papers which were published last year and two years earlier. So there are many ethical problems with the conduct of science which is what deals with ethics in science but I think these are ethical problems which scientists must address. They are problems which everyone understands. You know we shouldn't do wrong things in whichever sphere of human activity we are involved. So this again is a sphere of human activity where wrong things should not be done. So I think that the problem of ethics and science is not such an interesting problem. So you're going to talk about forests, agricultural land, in the case of water, portable water, or water that is used for irrigation. And in the case of air, of course, we're all worried about this. You would talk about clean air. All of us have to breathe it. So it really becomes the problem of development versus depredation.
And this problem, which is very popular now, everybody calls it sustainable development. It is in fact a buzzword. Today, if you say that you want to do something in sustainable development, it is somewhat easy to get money. But I, what I want to draw to your attention is something different. I want to draw to your attention a paper by Garrett Harding, which appeared in the magazine Science in 1968. And this was entitled The Tragedy of the Commons. Now this means that you have a problem which affects everybody. Now Hardin also drew attention to another fact. There are many problems that we are confronted with. Today one believes that if one is confronted with a problem, then the best way to solve that problem is to apply science and technology. Now if you apply science and technology, hopefully you will solve every problem that confronts humanity. But in discussing the problem of nuclear war, Wiesner and York had written another famous paper in which they had outlined a class of problems which they said are problems with no technical solution. And the problem of nuclear war was one which did not have a technical solution because the way the Americans and Russians tried to solve this problem at the height of the Cold War was if of what they call, what is also popular in our surroundings, the, you use the principle of deterrence. And then of course if you have a bomb, you have a bigger bomb and then you have a bigger bomb on both sides and then you keep on escalating. Then if the bombs are to be delivered with a missile, then you will have an anti-missile defense. If you have an anti-missile defense, then you will have an anti-missile missile defense and so forth. And this becomes an endless problem. And therefore, they said, Wiesner and York said, that the problem of nuclear war is a problem with no technical solution. So don't even try to apply science and technology to this kind of problem. Hardin suggested that there were other human problems for which there are probably no technical solutions. I like this uh, poem from a uh, little piece of verse from Goldsmith because when I saw this article, The Tragedy of the Commons, I was struck by the word commons. And I wanted to know where had this word commons really been used. And then I remembered that when I was in school, I had in fact come across this word and that was in Goldsmith's poem. This tells you that when you're in school, you should take the other subject somewhat seriously. And then what Goldsmith had said was, where then are, where shall poverty reside to escape the pressure of contiguous pride? If some commons fenceless limits trade, he drives his flocks to pick the scanty blade. Those fenceless fields the sons of wealth divide, and even the bare-worn common is denied. Now if you look at this, this is a problem that's been in India for a very long time. You know, everybody talks about land reform in a very theoretical manner. It's a very practical problem. And this, in fact, summarizes the problem of land reform itself. Uh, you know, everybody grazes their flock on common fields. And of course, when these are brought up by richer and richer people, then there's lesser and lesser place for the flock to graze. And sometimes when farmers become richer, they, their flocks also grow larger and larger and they eat up everything in sight and there's less for the what the poor farmers have so really it is those fenceless fields the sons of wealth divide and even the bare worn common is denied and it is this that I think Hardin has picked up in entitling so what we're talking about here is the competition for resources and the major problem is population the problems of population were recognized by Malthus in the 18th century and Darwin again in the 19th century. Darwin, in working on his ideas of biological evolution, was largely influenced by Malthus. And Malthus's original statement, we all remember, is that population, when unchecked, increases in a geometrical ratio. This end should not be there. Subs subsistence increases only in arithmetical ratio. A slight acquaintance with numbers will show the immensity of the first power in comparison of the second. Darwin, of course, said that although some species may be now increasing more or less rapidly in numbers, all cannot do so for the world would not hold. In nature, of course, when rat population increase beyond a point, they fight with one another and kill themselves up. I suspect that on an evolutionary time scale, which is thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, it is quite possible that if there are no great advances, the same kind of thing will happen to other species also. 
But Hardin, in his paper, which is now a citation classic, said, freedom in an unmanaged commons leads inevitably to ruin. In a crowded world, our only real freedom lies in joining with others, in choosing and implementing the forms of coercion. Mutual coercion, mutually agreed upon, which describes the result of any law in a democracy. Now, it, it is Hardin's use of the word coercion with democracy, which many people in the United States did not like. But if you think about it a little bit, all our laws are coercive in some sense. You have to have laws. They have to be coercive. Otherwise, freedom in an unmanaged commons leads inevitably to ruin. Sometimes when we look at our surroundings, and many of you will be administrators, managers, executives, and so forth, you will find, of course, that your companies run well under coercion, which is suitably disguised. Uh, they will not run well if you have no discipline whatsoever. And sometimes our public streets sometimes are an example of what happens when the commons is completely unmanaged by anybody. And really today when we think about the ethics of science, we might also think about the ethics of decision making in choosing technologies which are for application. And this really addresses the issue of what I would say are the tensions between free markets and the centralized management of the commons. And one must think about this issue. Now, I will briefly mention environmental politics because I think that is a subject which borders science and which you might like to think about. For example, everybody talks about climate change. And everybody says that climate change must be avoided. And then, of course, climate change is due to carbon dioxide emissions. And you might ask this question, who is responsible for carbon dioxide emissions in the world? Now, the Asian brown cloud of 2002 the Americans and the West generally, and this is where the problem really arises. Many papers appear in very important journals. These papers are sometimes authored by very influential scientists. They count Nobel Prize winners amongst them. And they had, in fact, written this paper on the Asian brown cloud of 2002. And the general suggestion was that in somehow somehow Asia is responsible for this brown cloud which has developed and this brown cloud is also going now to contribute in some significant way to global problems. This of course I don't think has turned out to be true in the three years that have passed afterwards. We also read about the Kyoto Protocol and what is called carbon trading. But really the key issue here is national development strategies versus international agreements. This is true everywhere. Now, one statement, and this is my own statement, is that austerity and self-restraint are not easy for individuals and certainly not for nations. So once we decide that we are not going to have small cars, we are not going to have one car per family, we are not going to take our car out when we don't need to, then of course we are no longer practicing austerity. Austerity is not a word which anybody likes. And therefore, self-restraint is another phrase which nobody likes. Therefore, these are not easy for individuals. They're not easy for nations. They will eventually be forced, but uh, that will be the coercive management of the commons which Hardin has talked about. Now, if you look at carbon dioxide emissions, and this is from the New Scientist 2004, the United States emits eight times as much CO2 per head of population as China and 18 times as much as India. But you will find... And global warming is related to CO2 and to methane emissions to a lesser extent. But you will find many papers in Nature and Science, the two most powerful scientific journals in the world, which talk about the methane emissions from the paddy fields of India and China. This would almost convey the impression that if India and China reduce the sizes of their paddy fields, there will be less methane going into the atmosphere, and therefore the contributions to global warming will be greatly diminished. But you might, of course, say that carbon dioxide emissions should not be by, by country, but carbon dioxide emissions should, in fact, be viewed at in terms of head of population. It will turn out that when we come to international agreements, we will always use population to our advantage. But when we come to any kind of national discussion, we would not like to use population because that will then redistribute the commons somewhat more equitably than we would like. But 
The Kyoto Protocol, which is a very interesting piece of discussion, talks about what are carbon credits. And when one talks about these things, one really doesn't know what they are, unless you paraphrase them somewhat simply. Carbon credits, from what I have understood, really will provide incentives to develop slowly for the poor countries. They will also allow the rich countries to pay and pollute. This, of course, is what is happening within India itself now. The rich will pay and the rich will pollute. So this only globalizes what is already, already happening nationally in the developing economies. Now, if you look at the United States and you ask what kind of science would they practice when confronted with a problem, now, in fact, it will turn out that carbon capture and sequestration will be a central element in the climate change science program. So what the United States hopes to do here is they hope that new technologies and new science can be developed, which will solve this problem of carbon dioxide and methane emissions, so that you will somehow be able to sequester carbon before it gets up there into the atmosphere. And one good thing with this, of course, billions of dollars will now be spent in areas other than uh, nuclear technologies. The, there are many other places where green technologies are being sought to be developed. And the promise here is that these new technologies will permit the kind of present day consumption to go on unchecked. Now here, of course, there, is, there are ethical questions raised. Should scientists now talk about the realities of these new technologies? Should scientists say that these new technologies are not going to come for the next 10 years, they're not going to come for the next 20 years, so you'd better worry about other forms of control at the moment. Let us worry about increasing consumption after these new technologies are in fact in place. I don't think people will say this. This is again an ethical question which one must confront. But I thought that I would go back to Goldsmith again, and this is again something that Goldsmith wrote. Goldsmith was viewed at that time as a man who was against progress, and sometimes I might also sound the same way, where he says that ye friends to truth, ye statesmen who survey, the rich man's joys increase, the poor's decay. Then of course he says, tis yours to judge how wide the limits stand between a splendid and an happy land. So really, one must really think about this a little bit when one thinks about the ethics of science. The finiteness of natural resources is an inescapable fact. Natural resources are not infinite, and they're not going to be infinite. But Mahatma Gandhi, quoted again in Frontline in February, said, indeed, the test of orderliness in a country is not the number of millionaires it owns, but the absence of starvation amongst its masses. Now, of course, when we take pride in the fact that many of our companies are in the Fortune 500, we might also look at the other development indicators which are put out by the international organizations and uh, worry about this a little bit. But in concluding, I will return to Bronowski. Bronowski, in his foreword to this wonderful book, The Ascent of Man, says, they cannot be a philosophy, they cannot even be a decent science without humanity. And here, he says some much later in his book, and I have picked this up a few hundred pages later, this paragraph which I'm going to read to you, I'll tell you the context in which he's written this paragraph. He is here assessing one of his friends. He's assessing a man with whom he collaborated for a little while, that is John von Neumann. He's the father of modern game theory, the father of modern computer science, cybernetics, whatever have you, and probably one of the most formidable intellects of mid-20th century science. Neumann believed in what Bronowski calls the aristocracy of the intellect. There was an arrogance in Neumann and many of the people, many of the scientists of the times, which believed that science would solve every problem and also that there was an aristocracy of the intellect. There were these people who understood everything, and then there were the people down below there who understood nothing, and one should not worry about them. And what Pronovsky says is this, 
the aristocracy of the intellect, and then he says, is a belief which can only destroy the civilization that we know. If we are anything, we must be a democracy of the intellect. We must not perish by the distance between people and government, between people and power, by which Babylon, Egypt, and Rome failed. What Brunovsky is worried here really is the fall of Western civilization. In fact, towards the end of his book, he worries about the Eastern civilizations which may rise as the Western civilizations fail. And he says, and that distance can only be conflated, can only be closed if knowledge sits in the homes and heads of people with no ambition to control others and not up in the isolated seats of power. So really what he's talking about is to democratize knowledge and to spread the word of science so that there can be more discussions on what the ethics of science are, what the consequences of science will be, and to look at these in a more rational way. But in my last slide, I will go back and show you Tagore's famous poem that all of you have read. But what I've really done with this, every one of you has read this and knows these words, but you will notice that towards the end of this, I have removed Tagore's last sentence. Because this was the one into which he says, into that heaven of freedom, my father, let my country awake. So he was being patriotic here. But I'm talking here not about the country, but I'm talking about science in general. And if you look at everything that Tagore has said here, he really is talking about science. I don't know whether he really had science in his mind, but everything he said could in fact be true for the practice of science, because it is in science really where the mind should be without fear and the head should be held higher. It is in science where knowledge should be free. It's in science where there should be no disciplinary borders. They should not be fragmented by all the boundaries that we see. It is really in science where words must come out from the depth of truth. And it is in science where one must strive for per perfection. And it is really science where there is a clear stream of reason which has really not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of habit. And if you really look at what scientists must be thinking about, their mind should really be led forward into everlasting, into ever widening thought and action. And therefore, when one thinks about the ethics of science, I believe one must really stand back, look at science, modern science as it has been practiced for the last three or four hundred years, ask the question, what have the advances of modern science contributed? It has contributed enormously to human progress. But it has also contributed to human sorrow in great extent. And one must ask, can one draw a balance between these two conflicting uh, problems of science? And in the practice of science, can there be ethical questions raised. In what way must these questions be raised and in what way must these questions be addressed? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Balram. It was really a very interdisciplinary lecture. And in many ways, it uh, links up to some of the responses and questions we had during the previous lecture. So with that, I'll open up for questions. Thank you. Yes. Any questions? Yes. Can we have, uh, I think, we have the, can we have the threshold or a borderline where we can call the practice of science is ethical and unethical? Because if I try to draw a reference to like, we have certain nutrients which we take in excess becomes toxicants. Yes. Now, science practice to a perfection, science practice to a particular level. Beyond that, it can become unethical because nuclear weapon or nuclear production is one of the areas where you talked about. Could we have any demarcation where a normal science that we practice, which is applicable to human being, may it be water pollution, may it be air pollution, may it be production, may it be pharmaceuticals, what, what should be the uh, benchmark where we can separate it out as ethical and unethical? Could it be possible? See, I suspect this is a very complicated issue in which every specific problem to which you, in which you use science to address a human problem, your definition of behavior that might be ethical versus 
an approach which might be unethical would depend on the specific issue that's being talked about. In fact, in some cases, it is very difficult even to decide whether uh, uh, of what is an ethical uh, solution. I will tell you one in the area of pharmaceuticals which I am familiar with, and it's a very difficult problem. Today, if as a result of scientific research, a new drug is developed for uh, a fatal disease, it needs to be tested before it is uh, freely prescribed. The tests, of course, involve testing on a population of patients who have the disease and testing, taking half of them and giving them a drug which might improve their condition. But the other half, you withhold the drug and you compare these two populations. Now here, of course, if you have a reasonable amount of laboratory evidence that this drug will work, then you would, of course, give it to everybody. But then you will not be able to fulfill the scientific test as to whether this drug is efficacious or not. Now, the families of patients where the disease is going to be fatal will, of course, demand that a treatment, even if it is an experimental treatment, even if it is an untried treatment, an unproved treatment, they will demand that it be given. Now, however, in order for this to be approved, for future generations and later, the scientific tests will have to be done. If, for example, a drug is proved that it is not efficacious, then of course it cannot be given because it just creates false hopes. But sometimes we have a problem, like excess of fluoride can have a disease. Yes. And uh, nutri in malnutrition of fluoride also has a disease. Yes. The, now, the, now, such situations, how do you demarcate? Like that means we do the science, bring it to application, bring it to engineering, go for a technology, test it, and then go back whether the science was ethical or not. After the technology developed its implementation, when the results are coming forth, then we know that whether the decision was correct or not. Yes, and sometimes if one actually... If I, in the path of progress, of course, you can't make progress unless you make mistakes. And uh, you must make several mistakes. The only question that is there in these discussions is whether we learn from our mistakes or we refuse to admit our mistakes. If we learn from our mistakes, fine, we go ahead. So we can say that mistakes made ignorantly or we are ignorant about that can be ethical. But oh, absolutely. I think mistakes which are genuine mistakes in which one does not know. You see, for example, blood transfusions carried out in France uh, before HIV diagnosis, uh, uh, testing of blood became common led to this problem where infected blood was given to lots of patients. The scientists who were in charge of this were later on hauled up before a criminal investigation. It was certainly improper to haul them up before a criminal investigation because they did not know that uh, this problem was there. But after years, the courts did rule that they were not wrong. Ethics, ethics is something that changes with time. And uh, science, we, we pretend that we're talking about absolutes. And so ethics is really a problem of society. Is it fair to even talk about ethics of science or scientists? This is hard to say. I think cultural mores may change as a function of time. But I suspect what constitutes uh, ethical behavior today would have also constituted ethical behavior. We could do a thought experiment. If you went back in time and said in the 15th or the 16th century, uh, would what we think today is ethical behavior, would that have been considered ethical behavior? Then I suspect in many major areas, I guess we would have the same definition. There may be some cases in which uh, there will be a blurring of an evolution of our ideas of ethics also. Yes, in many ways that was what in one of the quotes that I had, uh, morality and ethics. But of course, as he says, our ideas of morality also change, uh, uh, change with time. But we are talking on a time scale which is uh, still within living memory, sort of. as to whether possibly there could be a social check. Social uh, at the present context must mean, you know, global. 
because we don't have any fragment societies anymore. There is a global society. So a French sociologist, you know, Emile Durkheim, had argued in the context of social research, that is social facts, where he considered that social facts by nature must have exteriority and constraints. That is, they must be exterior to an individual, must be dictated by the society, and they must have a sort of constraining effect on the individuals so that the society's interest, you know, are not spoiled or gone against. So in that context, you know, even talking about Oliver Goldsmith, so long as society is able to dictate these terms, that this is the line which you can't cross to scientific research, I believe we can find a sort of, you know, solution to the problem. Yes, the problem is many times society is a formless uh, uh, organ. That, that kind of coherence of judgment will not be there. Usually the judgment comes from a very limited number of, uh, of people. And many times I think judgments about ethics and science would best be made by scientists themselves if they spent a little time worrying about it in conjunction with other people in other fields who were well informed. But in many cases it becomes very difficult to decide what is ethical and what is in the areas which I mentioned in biology, I think people are really wrestling with this uh, fact. We don't know. Yes. Yeah. Especially in the publication of articles by the journals, sometimes it looks regionalized. Even if the quality of work is not very good, probably a, a journal originating from USA, and if a person is from USA, it gets published. Whereas from other regions, it gets a little bit tough. So how does it stand in the ethics of the science? No, that is a somewhat simpler problem. That's a question of ethics in science itself, because the problem of publishing journals, peer reviewing them, accepting articles, is a problem which is located within science itself. There, there are standard norms for ethical behavior. But if somebody discriminates, then clearly the behavior may be unethical. But you know, in our, in societies generally, globally, unethical behavior sometimes is even the norm rather than the uh, exception. So, and nothing can be done about it. There, uh, you hope that it will not happen. <laughs> in your talk, you also mentioned about the use of science for private profit. Can you expand on this more? Because I think this is what we are facing now to a large extent, that science is being used more for private profit. And therefore, in fact, yesterday also we were listening to a lec the lecture by Dr. Kiran Mazumdar, where all these issues come up about how companies, corporates come in, they want to make quick money, venture funds want to come in. So can you elaborate on this? See, the one area where this is... Uh, the profit motive is clearly seen and easily appreciated is, for example, in the field of pharmaceuticals. And if uh, Kiran Mazumdar spoke here, she would have spoken about the biotechnology uh, industry. The uh, profit motive is high in the pharmaceutical industry, for example. But at the same time, uh, the benefits to people can be enormous. Today, for example, the diseases which affect the third world countries, uh, particularly African uh, countries, uh, they are not addressed by major pharmaceutical research uh, laboratories because there is no profit in finding cures for those diseases. And sometimes even if their internal research generates uh, scientific advance, that is not followed up afterwards because uh, it becomes unviable in a business or in a commercial sense. The World Health Organization all tried to address this problem by setting up internationally funded programs, what they call orphan disease programs or orphan drugs. So there are diseases which are literally orphans, but uh, if you do some work on them, you get paid for it. And uh, recently you would have seen this problem of pricing of drugs, where uh, 
Drugs which are needed in Africa, for instance, are excessively overpriced and they are protected by the new uh, patent agreements and so forth. So here there is a question of what would constitute ethical behavior by uh, major companies and to what extent can the profit motive actually drive scientific. Professor Jayant Murthy to deliver the vote of thanks. I had originally thought that this would be a talk of ethics in science, which is a clear black and white issue. Uh, instead, ethics of science is, uh, is a far more complex issue, and uh, I, I don't think Professor Balram has given us any clear answers. Nevertheless, uh, I, I thank him on behalf of all the participants for a uh, for most thought-provoking and stimulating th th talk. Thank you. Uh, Sangeeta will now present a small gift to you as a token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, we reconvene at 6.30 for the next lecture.